wait a moment, please. Um, so, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Elisa Cahue, Strategy and Innovation Officer at EGI Foundation, and I will be the chair for this session dedicated to uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning experiences. So, uh, our speakers today will be uh, Anna Sky from University of Manchester, uh, who will explain the AI experience in astronomy, Henning Muller uh, from He is So Vale, who will talk about the use of AI in health, and uh, finally, Andres Stork that will speak about the AI in manufacturing and, we, and the recent project Digit Brains, where EGI is partnered and will, prov will provide HPC and cloud computing to support uh, the pilots. So, um, after each session, we will dedicate five minutes for questions and answers. You can raise your hand and use the Zoom chat for comments. At the end of the session, we will have more space to discuss uh, further questions that may raise up during the, during the talks. And, and I just uh, want to remember that this session is going to be recorded. So uh, in case you want to appear with uh, your voice or, um, or your video, please um, take this in mind. So Anna, please, uh, can you share your screen? And in the meantime, I will introduce your, um, your bio. So, um, Anna Skaev is professor of radio astronomy at the University of Manchester, head of the Jodrell Bank Interferometry Center of Excellence and academic co-director of policy at Manchester. She led the design of the compute and storage for the European SKA Data Center in the Horizon 2020 INEAS project and is a board member of several national computing programs within the UK. One of the five, this is one of the five inaugural AI fellows of the UK's Alan Turing Institute, and uh, he's also honored by the World Economic Forum or as one of the 30 scientists and under the age of 40 in 2014. And also he, he has the Jackson with medal with the Royal Astronomical Society in 2019. So Anna, uh, what do you want? Thank you, Elisa, and uh, thank you to EGI for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to, to talk about the use of AI in astronomy to this audience. Um, so the, the work that I'm going to talk about um, is work that's, that's basically building up to the next big radio astronomy observatory, which is the Square Kilometre Array. Um, so the Square Kilometre Array is a global project um, that is undertaking to build the world's largest radio telescope. Um, it's going to be situated in two different locations. So it's a multi-component instrument um, in South Africa and Australia. And it's designed to answer some of the most important questions in, in astrophysics. Um, there are antennas already on the ground, although full construction isn't uh, expected to be complete until 2027. And, and data is already flowing. And I think the the, I won't go into the details of the SKA, but one thing I would like everyone to take away um, is the fact that, that the SKA itself is a, is a big data machine with raw data rates that uh, would result in, in storage of, of exabytes of data per year if we, if we kept the, the raw data. In terms of the, the compressed data that we do keep, the SKA is expected to deliver about 600 petabytes per year of um, processed data products. So these are these are compressed data products. Um, and that's a, a large volume of data, not only from a scientific perspective, but also from a, a commercial perspective. Um, to put it uh, into context, um, I apologize, these numbers are slightly old, I couldn't find anything newer at the moment. Um, compared to, for example, the five big experiments at CERN, um, they're currently producing about 73 petabytes of data per year. Um, However, I should say in 2027, when the SKA comes online, CERN, of course, will be producing an equivalent volume of data. 
And so the problems that I'm going to talk about from the scientific perspective also apply to particle physics and other areas where these huge volume, uh, huge data increases due to digitization of data have also um, become an issue. Um, so what's in the data for a radio telescope? Well, one of the primary data products from a radio telescope are surveys of the sky. And in those surveys, the SKA is expected to, de to detect hundreds of millions of different astrophysical systems. And most astrophysics these days is actually based on population analysis. And so we need to take those hundreds of millions of objects in our astrophysical images, and we need to be able to classify them, not only into categories of object that we already know about, but we also need to be able to identify um, which objects are examples of systems that we've never seen before. And of course, for this volume of data, we need to be able to do it in an automated fashion because it's just simply not feasible to do this manually. So to give you an idea of how the, how the data um, volumes are increasing or the data numbers are increasing for these individual sources, um, these are sort of four surveys from historical radio astronomy uh, or current radio astronomy instruments with the first two um, were produced around the year 2000 and the final two were produced in the last five years, let's say. Um, and you can see that the, the number of individual astronomical sources per square degree on the sky has increased significantly. Um, and for those, for those of you who aren't used to thinking in the spherical sky coordinates, there are, there are 40,000 square degrees on the sky. So you would have this number of objects detected by a, a particular instrument within one of those 40,000 square degrees. Now for an expert radio astronomer, um, it takes about a minute of looking at a morphologically diverse object in order to tell you what it is. And there are some examples of, of how radio sources might look on the right hand side here. So that means that one individual radio astronomer as an expert pro could probably classify about 125,000 sources per year if that was the only thing that they had to do. Now, of course, um, we're not just limited by the scientific community these days, we also have the citizen science community and the Radio Galaxy Zoo project um, has classified about 300,000 uh, astronomical sources using the efforts of 12,000 individual citizen scientists over the last approximately five years. Um, and of course, when you have citizen scientists rather than professional radio astronomers, you have, to, um, you have to also create a consensus. So there are multiple classifications from multiple people um, that, meet, that give you a final outcome. Um, but you can see immediately that those 125,000 or 300,000 sources over five years will not come close to helping us to classify the number of sources that we expect to see um, from some of these telescopes. For the Australian SKA Pathfinder telescope, that 2,900 sources per square degree translates into 60 million sources in total that will need to be classified. Um, so that's where we come to AI and machine learning. Um, because with machine learning algorithms, we know from experience that we can classify about 100 million sources in approximately 15 minutes, um, which is, of course, the great attraction for um, scientists working in astronomy because it, it, it not only simplifies the process, but it also makes it achievable within a reasonable time frame. And if we want to achieve the scientific impact of these new instruments um, in a time frame that is reasonable, given the investment that's been made, um, we're going to need to do this kind of automation. However, um, I like to put a question mark on the statement that machine learning will save us because um, machine learning is one of those um, approaches to data analytics that is, is very prone to misuse, um, I would say. And we see this not only, not only deliberate misuse, but, but simply... Um, perhaps a, a, a lack of attention to detail in some cases, which is not always um, required in a lot of the commercial applications of AI that we see. And in particular, a lot of the, the people who are at the, the forefront um, of these uh, commercial efforts are more interested in, in the advances than they are in the, the detailed analysis that scientists need to do. Um, and whilst I would like astronomy to move fast, I would prefer for it not to be broken along the way. Um, and we've seen examples of this already um, in the press where 
um, the, the, I think, over-optimistic application of AI to social problems has, has caused significant issues. Um, so what are some of the issues that we need to think about carefully when we are considering uh, AI for astronomy? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, so here's a selection of, of data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is an optical survey. It's one of the most widely used um, sky surveys in the world. It contains just over a billion different objects um, observed with a, um, uh, a particular optical telescope. Of those billion objects, about 100 million have extended uh, frequency measurements and 3 million, the subset of 3 million, have full spectroscopic labels. So you can think of this as having a full data set of a billion objects, 3 million of which are labeled with ground truth. Um, and the labels in this case for an astronomer would be star, a galaxy or a quasar. A uh, quasar is a, a galaxy with a supermassive black hole at its center. So one of the things that we've looked at is how could we take these 3 million labeled objects and use them to label those other billion objects and create a much bigger catalog for astronomers to use in their population analyses. And I'm just going to gratuitously show you a, a picture of, uh, of the, the classification that we actually did because I think it's quite beautiful. Um, and this is using a, a dimensionality reduction algorithm called UMAP which was extremely powerful for separating out different uh, uh, target classes within a, within a data set. However, the reason I'm showing you this is not because of this pretty picture, but because some of the issues that we found with this classification, which I think represent wider issues in astronomy. So within the 3 million labeled objects that we're using to train the algorithm in this case, there's a significant class imbalance most of the objects are actually galaxies. There are very few quasars and stars. And what that means is that the performance of the algorithm when we apply it to a test data set um, varies between the classes. We don't get a consistent performance. And not only is the performance inconsistent between classes, we find that if we um, limit our training sample using different um, brightness cutoffs, then we see different performance as a function of brightness for each of those individual classes. So for anyone who's familiar with the um, standard performance metrics, recall, precision, and the F1 score, here I'm showing those different metrics as a function of brightness for different objects with different cutoffs in the training data. And for anyone who's not familiar with these, these, uh, these metrics, all you need to take away from this figure is that in the ideal situation, all of those different colored lines should be on top of each other. And in the worst case situation, they should be widely separated. And you can see that we have a clear separation between the performance from different cutoffs. Now, the reason for this is, the reason this is important is that astronomical um, surveys, when we do a new survey, we do a new survey in order to achieve better sensitivity. So we're looking at a different brightness cutoff. What that means is that our training data and our test data are going to be different. And that class imbalance between the objects comes not just from the data taking, but it also represents um, intrinsic astrophysical evolution um, of different objects. So as we look further away from ourselves in the universe, we will see different class balances. And we can't predict those class balances in advance because that's, that's usually the thing we're trying to measure. Um, so most of the common methods for correcting class um, imbalance in machine learning applications don't work so well for astronomy data. We have to be very careful um, in how we deal with that class imbalance. We also have to be quite careful in how we decide which data to use for training and in fact how much data we use for training. Um, so for example, if we simply undersample the galaxies in our training data to create a balanced training set, we actually see a poorer performance um, when we apply that model to the test data. And that's because our, our test data and our training data just aren't representative of each other anymore. Um, when we do decide how much training data we need, we then have to think quite carefully about what that data is made up from. So in a naive application, I think I have a little cartoon here. 
in a naive application where you're trying to separate two classes of data, say this blue and the red class here, you might randomly select samples to train your model. But of course, in terms of the power of, of um, the power of deciding where that boundary between the classes lies, in fact, it's the samples that lie along the boundary that are most powerful in separating the, the different classes. Um, and this is a sort of this is a, the basic form of what's known as active learning. Um, is to, to deliberately choose examples um, of, of data that, that help you to improve your model performance. Now, of course, in the, the two class situation, this is much simpler than if you have multiple classes, for example, in the, in the uh, SDSS classification, it might look something more like this. Now to do this kind of active learning, and there are many different forms of, of choice of active learning algorithm, um, you have to evaluate a number of parameters for every data sample in the set. So for SDSS, we would need to pass through those 3 million objects hundreds to thousands of times in order to build up our training sample. And the reason I bring this up is because this is actually a, a very nice AI application for grid um, resources, because each of those individual samples can be evaluated individually, um, and it can be done in a perfectly distributed manner. Um, and it's, it's quite ideal for um, the kind of low memory um, grid resources that are used in, in particle physics. And that's one of the use cases we've been looking at for those resources. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight um, is that a lot of machine learning algorithms, um, and particularly when the convolutional neural networks are being used, are used as a kind of black box and we don't have a, a clear picture often of what is being um, used by the algorithm in order to classify the data. Uh, and I use CNNs as an example here because of course the feature extraction is done within the learning algorithm as well. Um, and a nice example I, I, I like to use for this is uh, that there are many um, online um, image recognition algorithms which you could show this picture to, and they would tell you that it's a sheep. And the reason for that is that when they've been trained, they've been trained to identify sheep by being given lots of images of sheep standing in fields. And what the algorithm has actually learned is not that the sheep itself is the sheep, but that the background in the image is the sheep. And so the algorithm learns to identify the image that it's given in the training set, but not from the properties of the image that you as a human would look at and say is a sheep. And so if you gave it a picture of a sheep standing in the middle of a city, it would probably tell you it was something else. It would tell you it was a dog or a cat. Um, so another thing that we're particularly interested in um, from an astronomical perspective is, is understanding how the algorithms are learning um, to classify different astronomical objects. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at here is attention gating, which is a mechanism for um, correlating the feature maps at different stages in a convolutional neural network with the final output um, in order to identify what it is in the image that the algorithm is actually looking at. Um, and this is a technique that has been developed. It originally came from, from natural language processing and then it was developed for medical applications. And the reference here is for uh, 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 sonograph uh, scans. But on the right hand side, you can see it applied to uh, radio astronomy images, um, where the top map is showing you the intensity distribution in a radio image, and the lower map is showing you the, the attention that the algorithm is showing. And you can see that the algorithm is, in this case, looking at the, the radio astronomy intensity. Um, if we show, if we applied this to the sheep classification algorithm, for example, we would see that the attention was spread around the background of the image rather than onto the sheep itself. So the reason we do this is not only to make sure that the algorithm is looking at the correct um, object in the field, but also to understand or interpret, help interpret the features that the, the algorithms are using. Um, so for example, this is uh, uh, just a couple of images of different types of radio galaxies. And I, I do appreciate that to non-radio astronomers, these, these images may not look particularly different, but uh, take it from me that the, the image on the left-hand side is a, is a Fanarov class one radio galaxy and the image on the right is a Fanarov-Riley class two 
radio galaxy. Um, and what you can see below the two intensity images are the attention maps um, from our convolutional neural network. And what you can see is that the distribution of attention in the images is actually significantly different. Um, for the class one radio galaxy, it's very centrally concentrated. And for the class two radio galaxy, it's quite um, distributed around the edges um, of the radio galaxy itself. And this actually mimics what a radio astronomer would do to classify these radio galaxies. And it gives us confidence that our algorithm is actually um, extracting the same features that we as humans would use to classify these radio galaxies. So there are many things that I haven't um, had time to talk about here, um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the, the issues that I think uh, face um, astrophysics in particular um, when it comes to um, the application of AI um, from a practical point of view. And the, the sort of the, the key challenges we face are transferring knowledge from existing data without introducing biases. So this comes back to my, my points about class balance um, and the, the difference between new and old surveys. Um, and of course, I'm not optimistic enough to think that we can ever not introduce any bias at all. So we also need to work out how we can handle those known biases. Um, and then the third point, which I, I do think is extremely important, but I haven't um, included a wider discussion of here is, is how do we quantify the uncertainty in our results? So the use of Bayesian neural networks, for example, in, in astrophysics is becoming more widespread than, than their standard frequentist counterparts. And that's because we need a posterior uncertainty from our models on any, any um, output that's derived um, from, from a machine learning model. So with those things in mind, um, we need to be aware that machine learning models that generalize well, i.e. The, the, typical, the typical performance uh, metrics that are generalized, that are optimized for in commercial algorithms are likely not suitable for, for our scientific use. Um, we need to learn how to build machine learning models that work across different data sets. And we need to find a priori methods for handling um, things like class and balance. Um, and we also need to be prepared for our, for our existing paradigms to be challenged by unsupervising machine learning. But if we can't quantify things like bias and uncertainty, it's gonna be very difficult to redefine those paradigms. And just finally, some, some um, experiential um, things that we, we have found is that um, GPUs are obviously essential for deep learning. The matrix multiplications are just optimally done on the GPU. Um, however, we, we've also found that if you, if you wanna do something more than deep learning, then heterogeneous compute is really quite useful. And there are certainly particular AI applications where distributed grid resources are highly effective um, and active learning is a good example of that. So I hope that this has been useful in some way for the wider audience. Um, thank you again for the invitation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anna, for, for your very interesting presentation. And uh, I, I would like to give the floor to uh, to give, give the opportunity to anyone in the in the audience that could uh, have um, any questions. Um, if not, I would like to ask you, uh, well, how is artificial intelligence and the new approaches uh, brought by artificial intelligence being accepted by, by astronomers? Um, do you anticipate any resistance? Um, so yeah, so the, it's a it's a mixed reaction. It has to be said. So the um, there is a there is already a significant um, component of astronomy that's based on inference um, and and, um, and inference based modeling. And so um, there's a an expectation of statistical rigor in the application of AI to astrophysics that isn't always met. I think, um, and so it's been. The, the, there's been a, a mixed response when particular algorithms can't be expressed um, uh, with clarity, I would have to say, um, mainly because those posterior uncertainties can't be, can't be quantified. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a bit of an alarm bell 
um, for astronomy. At the same time, the you know AI is cool, so everyone wants to do it, and um, and uh, also the data volumes are just making it impractical to do anything else. So I think it's there's a we're sort of in a a bit of a um, a learning curve at the moment, and we need to reach a sort of stable stable situation with AI and astronomy. Um, there's a question in the chat about um, what kind of role I see for HPC um, in meeting AI challenges in radio astronomy, um, which I'm happy to take. Um, so if the question is, if the question is, is about HPC in, in, in the true HPC sense, um, I would say that there's definitely a role. Um, it depends on the application. So certain, um, certain aspects of radio astronomy are extremely, um, let me say, so there are certain aspects of radio astronomy that are extremely memory intensive. And so having highly parallel systems with large memory available are very useful. Um, and HPC in that sense um, is, is definitely, definitely um, useful. But I would say that, that one of the issues with radio astronomy is that it is a very diverse field and that it's not just diverse in terms of the analysis that needs to be done, but it was also diverse in terms of the data that's taken. Um, so depending on the analysis, HPC, HTC, grid or cloud um, are all applicable to this, to this field. Okay, and now Valentin from KIT um, asked that from the resources and infrastructures point of view, are you missing some, uh, which kind? Um, so to be honest, I think everything's out there if you know where to look. I think the um, perhaps one of the so one of the biggest problems that we face is not um, a lack of available resources, but a lack of infrastructure local to our data storage. So a typical a typical ob observation from say the Meerkat telescope operating in South Africa produces a data set that's about one point five terabytes, and unlike say um, equivalent particle physics data, it can't be split up. You have to process it all at once. Um, and if you're doing a, 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 um, a, a combined survey, you can imagine that you might have several hundred of those data sets that all need to be processed in the same application. So having the appropriate compute resources local to the data is probably the, the thing that we miss the most. Um, so one of the issues we found using commercial cloud is that the, the I mean, the, the data IO is the, is the limitation. Okay, thank you. Um, Anna, we need to move now to Henning Muller. Um, let me introduce Henning while he's preparing um, his presentation. Um, Henning Muller studied medical informatics at the University of Heidelberg, Germany, and then worked at uh, Daimler Benz Research in Portland in the USA. He holds a PhD degree in computer vision at the University of Geneva, uh, with a research stay at Monash University in, in Melbourne, Australia. Since 2002, uh, Henning has been working for the Medical Informatics Service at the University Hospital of Geneva. And since 2007, he has been a full professor at the uh, HISO Ballet. And since 2011, he's responsible for the uh, e-health unit of uh, the school. Since 2014, he's also a professor at the Medical Faculty of the University of Geneva. And in 2015, he was on sabbatical at the Martino Center, uh, part of Harvard Medical School in Boston, uh, to focus on research activities. Henning is coordinator of the Examod EU project, was coordinator of the Kersmo EU project, and scientific coordinator of the Visceral EU project. Since early 2020, he is also a member of the Swiss National Research Council. So, Henning? Okay, thank, thank you very much for the for the introduction. Do you hear me well? Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, um, so it's interesting to to listen to the talk just before because I think we have quite a few challenges in common in using AI on a very different type of data. So we work on health data. So mainly uh, what we do is medical image analysis, but uh, we also mainly work on deep learning approaches and many of the challenges like interpretability are extremely important because as a physician, you don't want to trust a black box, but you want to have a clear reasoning for why a specific decision is taken. And it's also important to quantify the trust you have in a specific decision, because some of the decisions might be on a decision boundary, others are further away. And um, I will focus in, 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 in this presentation on two EU funded projects, one called Process, which is an infrastructure project and EXA mode, which is a big data call of age 2020, uh, where we both work on histopathology images. And this might be a slightly creepy image that I put up. So this is me and one of my colleagues, Manfredo, literally fighting cancer cells. So this is what histopathology images look like. So they are microscopic images. And you can see some of our algorithms where we try to detect small regions. Um, like, I mean, this is a random sampling to get examples for cancer versus non-cancer cells. And just to um, give you a bit of, a, of an idea of what histopathology imaging looks like. So on the upper right, you can see uh, um, a picture, what's called a whole slide image. So this is a, um, a digitized image of a tissue sample from a prostate needle biopsy. So, um, so you put little needles in your prostate to get tissue out. So each one of these thin lines might be about a millimeter or half a millimeter wide. So it's uh, images that are uh, are then magnified, they are scanned at a very high resolution. So most of the time, resolutions of the scanning are about 40, 40 times magnification. And what you can see in the image, I can maybe take my um, pencil and mark that um, a little bit, putting it in red, so you can see it here. If I take a little um, sample, this is corresponds to this part here and then I can take a little area here, and again, I can zoom in. So that's what histopathologists do. So they have these really large images, and they zoom in and out. So a standard image at a 40 time magnification would be in the range of 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So it's reasonably large images, plus information is hidden in different scales. So some things you might need to look at the uh, really at the cellular level, others, it's a uh, uh, it's a mix of uh, cells that actually give an, if an idea about it. So compressed, the images are about 10 gigabytes, uncompressed, 30 gigabytes. Pixel size is in the range of 250 nanometers. Again, that really depends on the scale. There's a very, very large variety. So every lab has their own way of preparing the images. So I stole this from, from the web. I mean, this is about uh, uh, animal uh, histopathology, but it's the same for humans. So you you have a bit of tissue, you dissect it, you clean it, uh, you conserve it, put it into paraffin, then you have a block that you can freeze and you then, then do sectioning. So you take small cuts of this, uh, 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 of this tissue that you put on glass slides. So this is really uh, uh, thin, so in the nanometer range uh, uh, are these cuts. Then you stain it, so you put chemicals on top of them to make certain structures visible. So just to give you an example, so here you can see in sort of bluish or uh, scale, it's the nuclei, and then you have other tissues that are more in a, uh, in a, in a, in a radish type of uh, uh, stain. But there are many, many other stains, so you can have very specific stains uh, for specific applications as well. And afterwards, currently most of the analysis is done uh, in analog fashion, so via uh, a microscope. So people look at them, they zoom in, they have several magnifications, look around the slides to find areas that are relevant for treatment. So usually for cancer, you want to have the most aggressive areas and you want to uh, quantify these areas and then decide, do you take an operation or do you take a different type of treatment, for example? And then if, uh, uh, um, I mean, if you do that in analog form, you then directly generate a report. Whereas if you scan it, store it, you can do image analysis, you can do detection, uh, you can do quantification uh, of the outcomes and use that then as uh, quantitative parameters for the report generation. 
So just to give you some ideas, as I said, like it's about 30 gigabytes per image, but then per biopsy, you need like, for example, if you do needle biopsies, you usually take 12 to 15 samples. So you might have four to five images uh, with like uh, three needle biopsies on each of them. So it's easily 150 gigabytes per patient. And if we look at some of the areas that we're, uh, that we're dealing with, like breast, colon, lung, cervix, prostate, there are screening programs. So millions of people are analyzed every year, first in radiology. And if there's anything suspicious, they take a biopsy to then detect what type of, uh, if there's like a benign or a malignant tumor, and also what is the staging or grading of the tumor that you then use for uh, taking treatment decisions. So any university hospital would have thousands of these um, that are then stored like physically as frozen samples. So both the glass slides, but also other bits of, uh, of the tissue that are in paraffin embedded, that they, they are also stored in tissue banks because possibly you can retake them, you can use different stainings, or you can also do genetic analysis on, on the data, for example. And it's a domain that's in the process of becoming digital. So there are a few hospitals in the world that are fully digital, but a very small number. But with the whole slide scanners being available, this is increasingly becoming digital because everything is stored as frozen sections. Actually, we can digitize archives as well. And this is something that I came across. I mean, that was announced two weeks ago that there's a company called Prosia that developed a, a product called Concentric. And they will now digitize what I marked here, um, the archive of 55 million glass slides. And then you have 31 million bodies. So you can take several cuts of them uh, and wet tissues. So if I made a little bit of calculation, so just to impress everybody. So here, um, if you just take like one slide of the 31 million and plus 55 million and the 500,000, we have 80.5 million tissue samples of a size of about 30 gigabytes. I mean, we're solidly in the exascale range here, just to give you an example of uh, what this could look like. And we're talking about a single center. I mean, there are hundreds of centers in the world. This is one of the biggest historical ones that has like 100 years of that. But um, so in terms of uh, uh, high performance computing, what we have is quite specific demands because most of what we do is using deep learning. Deep learning, um, so we try to detect specific regions, anomalies, uh, specific infiltrations of cells. And, uh, 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 and for that, we generally use deep learning, so GPUs. And um, I mean, there are many data centers that have GPUs, but most often they don't have the fastest, the latest GPUs. So uh, we often buy a few local, but then we also collaborate quite a bit with, uh, with data centers. But it's not only GPUs, because we also need to have we need to pre-process the image. Every vendor of sli uh, the slide scanners has their own proprietary format. And as these images are large, I mean, we need to first transform them to a general format, cut them apart. And usually we uh, cut them in, into smaller pieces to be able to treat them better, but also at several scales. So we take like five, 10, 20, 40 times magnification, and then we create smaller tiles. So we have GPU, CPU, and as said before, I mean, the data volumes, also make network bandwidth a major problem uh, and something that we need to deal with. Because uh, if, we, if, we, if we're moving uh, the information and we're in the petabyte range, some of the things just become very impractical. And even in, in the terabyte range, if we have 100 terabytes to transfer between servers, this can really slow down uh, processing. And in the end, the bottleneck might not actually be the GPU, but uh, it, it might be other things. And locally here, we have very fast GPUs, but on the other hand, we have the data stored on NAS where we depend on the, net, on the network bandwidth. And when we compare to data centers where GPUs often are slower, they have a very high throughput. So this is something that is often more important. And we worked on, uh, uh, on the specific part of histopathology image analysis with respect to detection, but also interpretability of the outcomes in a pro uh, project called PROCESS. So it's an infrastructure project that started in 2017. And it just finished three days ago, basically at the end of October. And uh, the objective of the project was to develop access scales tools. There are, uh, I think there were four different uh, data centers. So it was coordinated by uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in, in Munich, the, which is linked to the Leibniz Rechenzentrum. But then there are uh, computing centers also in, in the Netherlands, in Poland and in Slovakia that were part of the project. 
And so there were several use cases, were one of the use cases, but the idea was really to bring the tools to something practical. Uh, so uh, that is what we worked on. We used a data set that was released as part of a scientific challenge. So we didn't have any specific ethical con constraints. We didn't need to use, uh, 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 we, need to, we didn't need to apply for ethics to acquire new data, but we reused existing data. So it's a couple of uh, uh, terabyte compressed, so uncompressed, it's uh, in the range of like 10, 10 terabytes or something, something like that. And we were looking into a, how we can increase the performance using uh, a more computational power, but also looking at what are the constraints and what are the bottlenecks in different scenarios? And now uh, uh, we have a second project that we coordinate here in, in Sierra, which is called Examode, so Extreme Scale Analytics via Multimodal Ontology Discovery and Enhancement. The idea is to take some of the tools we developed in process also and now work on clinical data, because here in this project, um, we, uh, we work on uh, with two medical centers that supply us clinical data. And we have four use cases focusing on lung, colon, serving uterix, and also uh, uh, on celiac disease, so uh, gluten allergies. And uh, uh, so it was ICT call 12, which is a big data call. So again, with the objective to, to work on very large scale. Just to give you an idea also of this project, so we have a consortium of seven partners. So it's a reasonably small project from uh, five countries. We have uh, SIFSARA, so the Dutch Supercomputing Center, sort of as a basis because everything should be run there. So the data should reside in one spot where everybody runs the computation because communicating the data will become very impractical at some point. Then we have two academic partners. So it's us focusing on the image analysis aspects at the University of Padova, really looking more at the text and semantics. And similarly, we have two industrial partners that uh, uh, are then exploiting the results onto text, or which is now called Sirma AI is a Bulgarian company focusing really on semantics and text processing and Microscope IT. It's a Polish company looking more into uh, decision support for, uh, for, for images. And in between, we have two medical partners. So one large uh, hospital and one medical center with a very strong histopathology experience. Plus the medical center in Catania is uh, one of the first hospitals in Europe to become fully digital. This is a bit the workflow. I mean. I, don't have much time to go into all of the details, but what we would like to do is to really look at uh, uh, the pathology reports that are available, the images that we have available, and then work on using these weak annotations, so annotations that we already have uh, to, to build decision support, and also use leveraged images that we have in the scientific literature uh, to, uh, uh, to have a diversity in the images that were produced for the training of our algorithms, and then work on exploitation. So um, as I mentioned, deep learning is what we do and deep networks not only require a lot of computation, but also very much training data. Uh, otherwise performance generalization is limited. So we need diversity and uh, uh, we need, uh, we have a very high class imbalance. So quite often we have rare diseases where that even in a large university hospital we have like one or two cases maybe per year. Advantages, these are the cases that are usually described in the literature and that's what we'll try to work on. And once so we want to work on deep labels or leveraging text and images together. And for that, we take uh, images from the literature, which is not the typical ones, but the unusual, untypical ones that are generally used for this. And the uh, um, thing is also that here we don't have the full resolution. So we often have only small tiles, but we do have a large variability of the images because they're created in different laboratories, which we need for generalizability. And it's also an exponentially increasing content because the number of published images that are made available in this case in PubMed Central um, uh, are uh, very large. And what we do is, so we usually rely on a, on a few uh, manual annotates so where we have manually annotated regions uh, to validate our algorithms. So we also use those to do the fine tuning, but then we can use uh, these to actually train uh, another system that can then work on uh, images where we have global labels and where we can try to detect the regions that are most severe, for example. And I mean, I will not go into the details of those, but we're getting into uh, a range where we're very close to the disagreement of uh, human observers. So histopathology 
is an area where there's a reasonable disagreement between experts uh, who analyze the tissue. And here we're getting very close to, to this performance. So as a conclusion, so I mean, deep learning really has much potential, but we need a lot of training data to make the, uh, to get a good performance, but particularly to work on generalization performance, because we often have very different images. And if it is trained on, on one set of data, it might not at all work in a different set of data. And the algorithms don't realize when they're actually not working on the right data. So uh, in that case, we also need this interpretability and explainability to make sure that specialists actually get this. Um, we need, uh, it's hard to get like manually annotated images. That's why we want global labels. And this is also why we need strong computing infrastructure. And looking at the data volumes, it just doesn't become practical to, to download uh, hundreds of uh, terabytes of images, uh, but rather have the data and the computation take uh, place in the same place where we can then also uh, have the strong infrastructures. And I mean, there's more information on that. I mean, thanks to Verizon 2020 in the European Union for the funding both of AXA mode and also of process. If you have questions, you can contact us and there's more on our institutional webpage. And obviously this is not only my work, but it's work of a larger number of people in our lab. And I mean, this picture is not up to date, but it gives you a bit of an idea of different people working on this. Thank you very much. I mean, I talked a little bit longer than I had, but yeah. there's hopefully still some time for questions. <laughs> I mean, we, we have uh, some time uh, yet. Um, I, I would like to ask you a question. Um, the COVID crisis showed uh, the lack of integration of infrastructures, data or services uh, for health between countries and even regions. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the main struggles? I mean, what one of the difficulties we're facing right now is that, uh, um, like, whenever there's a high peak, like what we have in, had in spring for a few months, but now it's happening at the same time. So all of the medical centers reorganize. So many of the standard procedures are put on hold. So there's fewer operations. So anything that is not considered urgent is not done. Plus, uh, I mean, now they don't work on the cancer or uh, celiac disease cases that uh, those are the histopathologists actually work more on tissue samples, for example, from COVID, from patients related to that to understand more of this. So resources are shifted. So anything that is related to data acquisition and getting feedback from clinician is getting much more difficult. So the, it's particularly uh, the, um, uh, the medical centers that uh, become our bottleneck because they need to provide data uh, they need to also uh, like select the cases, annotate them, give us feedback on the tools and algorithms, and clinicians are quite overloaded with uh, the current situation. I mean, that's the main. For most of the uh, computer science research, it's difficult because we cannot meet in person, but much of it we can leverage. I mean, particularly if it's temporary, if it's for a year, for example, we can deal with it. So we had the last meeting was in Amsterdam in person in January, and it was pretty just before actually everything stop down so it was actually good to meet but now we're we're looking to see how to leverage that but we have re very regular phone conferences and people coordinate also in smaller groups well i was thinking in uh, uh in what will be the top priorities for for towards a working uh, federated uh, system i mean so um you you mean in terms of the infrastructures or in terms of uh, of what exactly? What will be the priorities to create like a federation for for the health? I mean, I think it's important to look at uh, uh, at all disease. I mean, it's important to uh, maybe in a specific part to to focus on 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 COVID cases, but the it is something that changes very very quickly. So I mean, now everybody's working on uh, like uh, treatments, etc. But uh, I think it's not, it's important to not forget about all of uh, the diseases like cancer, which continues in the same way as before. Yeah, and I think well, it's when I was uh, talking about the federated system, it, it, it's, uh, it's global and not focusing specifically for solving the problems of the COVID. I, I only mentioned the COVID because it was like oh. the real scenario that uh, gave us uh, the understanding that the, the uh, the sharing of the of the data and the and the access to some of the infrastructures uh, for sure could be improved in, in this way. I mean, it's. Uh, I think uh, there's. All, I mean, with medical data, there's always the challenge of sharing because of ethical questions. But the frameworks, particularly in the two hospitals that we work with, 
are fairly well put in place. So we made an ethics request and I, I don't think there's any blocking parts for the clinical data. So we treat it in a, in a so they're transmitted in a safe way to the participating uh, data center at Safsara and they're treated there. So, uh, I mean, we can control access, we can log access. So there's no, uh, uh, plus everything is anonymized. So we, uh, all of the data we have in the project, it's fully anonymized. So we don't have any uh, idea about uh, identifying information of the people. So I don't, so currently there's no particularly a problem in the data sharing. Plus we want to link it with a publicly available data sources. So there's an increasing number of data sources that are made available via Zenodo, via TCIA, TCJ. So these are image repositories of the National Cancer Institute, but also in the public, like uh, in the literature. So we're matching actually publicly available sources with clinical data that are more protected in this case. So I don't, I, currently there's no particularly policy blocking part in, in what we have because we pretty much follow the guidelines. It's sometimes a bit slow to be able to share data and make it available even in a, in a restrained group. But I think it's, it is personal data. So it's also important to pay attention to this. Okay. And uh, we have another question from Juan Do Wang that as you mentioned it, that uh, is to, is to pathology will require central infrastructure, but the data policy, if it's a uh, potential for a decentralized one of the managing those medical data? I mean, there, there's a bit of a, I mean, I, I mentioned centralized infrastructures, but one of the things that we see with hospitals, particularly in Switzerland, but also on a European level is that actually the infrastructures are getting into the hospitals. And then we're looking into something uh, uh, that is called federated learning, where you would actually have a model that is trained in different spaces and then combined. And I think this is likely, so there will, when I'm talking about centrally, I mean, I just meant that we're not chipping around data, but the data are treated uh, uh, in, in a central place. And this central place could be per hospital. So we might have, if we want to have multi-centric studies, one computing node per hospital, and then we get the aggregated data somewhere together in a, uh, uh, in a, in a computing center. So all of the private data could then remain in, in, in local repositories and only the public data are added to, to a central repository. I mean, this is one of the models that we're looking into. Okay. Uh I don't seem to hear you. I, I was telling that we have more questions, but we need to move now to the next uh, uh, presentation uh, about manufacturing. So Andrea, Andre, sorry, uh, if you can start uh, sharing your screen and in the meantime, I will introduce. Andrea yeah. Storky is, um, Andre Stork is head of the Interactive Engineering and Technologies Group at Fraunhofer Institute for Computing Graphics. And um, uh, at Fraunhofer Institute, uh, an uh, honorary professor of computer science at the Technological University of Darmstadt. Andre Stork holds a PhD in computer science. The topic of his dissertation was 3D interaction and visualization techniques for using centered modeling application. Uh, his major research interests in, interest are geometry modeling and shape processing, uh, 2D, 3D uh, interaction techniques, simulation uh, and scientific visualization. Andres Stork has authored and co-authored more than 200 papers in the field of various interests. He has been a member of the program committee or acted as a reviewer in uh, many international conferences, workshops, workshops, and journals. He lectured computer graphics three and he, uh, has lectured geometric methods in a uh, CAD CHI at a uh, Technolog Technological University of Darmstadt. He has experience in participating technically and financially coordinating uh, European um, funded projects for almost 20 years. Uh, currently, he is the coordinator of cloud factoring and technically coordinator of DigitBrain, both I4MS projects in the field of modeling, simulation, data analytics, and digital twins in manufacturing SMEs. Andrea Stork is a member of the IEEE, uh, Eurographics, ACF, ACM, Gels Trust for Informatic, and VDI. So, Andrea, when you want. 
Yeah, thank you, Elisa. I hope everybody can hear me well and see the slides. Can you just confirm? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to give the talk. Um, this talk is about, uh, well, digital brain and the relationship with manufacturing, machine learning, and AI, but also simulation and modeling uh, to, to a large extent. Uh, digital brain is a, it's a pretty recent project that we started um, roughly three months ago. So um, it is a comparably big European project. It is um, running in the factories of the future framework. It's part of the ICT innovation um, initiative for small and medium-sized enterprises. And that um, brings me also to another level of, uh, of, of challenges here that, um, than the ones that we have heard about. So some of the challenges here are really to bring uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to the world of HPC computing, machine learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you see those parties that we already have in the project on the right-hand side, the so-called experiment partners. Um, these experiments um, are our use cases, and I will go talk about them later on. Um, those partners are supported by the digital innovation hubs that you see at the lower left corner and um, by a large set and variety of core technical partners. More, um, some are more into machine learning and artificial intelligence. Others are more into the simulation bits and pieces, code simulation, uh, functional mock-up uh, interfaces and units. Others are more in the infrastructure level and supporting different infrastructures and abstracting from different infrastructures. And yeah, and EGI, which are marked here, um, is our infrastructure provider. So thanks again for inviting me to the talk. Here. Well, as I said, um, DigitBrain is part of the I4MS initiative, and uh, that is directed towards the small and medium-sized companies in the manufacturing industry. Um, we have started mid, mid this year, and we, we run for three and a half years a number of partners. It's pretty big, uh, 36. One thing that I'll come back to at the end of my talk is the so-called open call scheme. So this project has not just the 36 partners I, I mentioned, it has uh, the, the opportunity, it offers the opportunity for new partners to come in into our open call schemes with new challenges from the manufacturing industry with respect to simulation and data analytics, machine learning. So that may be interesting for some of you. More details about that later on. Okay, what are we doing here? So um, this is in the area of creating digital twins. Digital twins kind of mimic certain manufacturing behavior or manufacturing machines to be able to simulate and to predict their behavior, and not only for single machines, but for instances of many machines and um, or, or products. So um, products in the industrial sense used to produce other goods, other products. So we want to leverage Edge Cloud and HPC-based computing and, and actually also um, local compute resources, even down to the level of, of, of the sensors um, to, to, to optimize um, machine um, manufacturing processes for the future to optimize design of new products by augmenting the concept of the digital twins covering the full cycle and also adding some, some yeah, memorizing capability so that the digital brain actually covers uh, the history and the provenance of how these uh, manufacturing devices um, develop and evolve and help progressing them for the future and enable a business model which we call manufacturing as a service, but that's probably beyond the scope of this talk today. So we have seven um, application experiments, seven use cases, and they they cover a large variety of different uh, of different scenarios. So starting with manufacturing of uh, fine uh, woolen fabrics, um, injection molding, 
process optimization for for creating for manufacturing roof systems but also um, going into the area of editing manufacturing where also images play a role to analyze whether the manufacturing process creates some some deficiencies in in, in the product um, whole process chains that addressing the forming of aluminum parts for instance or even industrial products that are used in, in agriculture by farmers um, for yeah, harvesting. So those are robots that are moving in the field and they all send data and there, there is always a digital twin to be developed for these products in their variety and in the uh, in the multiplicity that they have. So we have different instances, we have many instances of them that we want to cover. And then there is another use case in additive manufacturing. So all of them are concerned, as I said already, by industrial products. So products that are used to produce other other things, other, other products, and uh, data from these industrial products. And if they they completely cover the range um, from uh, yeah, sensors in those physical props up to the uh, models that, that be uh, simulated using HPC resources, for instance, but also algorithms that are needed to evaluate these models and different kinds of algorithms, um, some off-the-shelf simulation algorithms, solvers, but also reduced order models um, derived from these um, sophisticated models that can then be applied to these to these products and and, and being executed um, on local compute resources or even embedded systems so th those are these different kinds of challenges to kind of develop an infrastructure um, or develop a system architecture that that covers that uh, variety so all these use cases ca capture history and provenance data. I'd like to go into two of the use cases quickly to give you an idea what they try to address and what is the current status and, and what uh, DigitBrain will bring to that. So um, one of these processes is in, in injection molding and um, this uh, use case is about creating reduced order models for injection molding machines that then can be applied directly on the machine level. And today, developing these models is a process that takes weeks um, because you need to create a high amount of several single simulations following a design of experiments approach. So you create typically hundreds of simulations. And um, in these simulations, you try to derive by different algorithms, um, model order reduction algorithms. You can also apply machine learning. So in, in scientific machine learning, machine learning has been applied to that as well to, um, to create a map of dependencies between the input parameters and the uh, key performance indicators that kind of are kind of the output of the, of, of the simulation without always rerunning the simulation. And by sampling the design space and reducing it, you can then provide a tool to the machine operator where he can, um, where can he, where, where he can react to changing um, conditions to optimize the, 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 the setting of the machine to these changing conditions. So that's summarized here. We want to um, squeeze the process from a few weeks to a few days by applying HPC uh, resources to run all the different simulations in parallel, but also to create re the reduced order models, um, put them into functional mock-up units, and then apply them on an everyday basis on the machine level, integrating sensor data and um, interfacing sensor data with these um, with these FMUs. The second scenario comes from aluminum forming. So that's a whole process chain where the factory is interested to have a digital twin for the whole chain and optimize it um, based on the different technologies being, being available. So all these components have different control systems and subcomponents. They need to be integrated into a into a 
uh, into a more abstract model where the dependencies are, are covered between the different things. So um, at the moment, these what-if analysis are not possible for um, for the for the end user in our in our scenario, and um, the they don't have digital twins yet. They cannot use them in the whole process of um, offering their 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 machines, offering their services in the bidding and negotiation phase. But then also when it comes to um, simulating services and providing services all along the life cycle of the different clients. So they, they are striving for um, creating um, this kind of bi-directional link between real plants and the digital representation. And that's what's going to be achieved um, in this experiment with different partners that working on the, on the digital product planes or the digital twin components um, based on embedded systems um, contained in the machines. And for all that, we are probably developing and designing our, our system architecture. And here at the bottom, you see so the, the hardware level, if you, if you like. Uh, in the production sites, we have the industrial products, we have uh, sensors, we have edge devices, local compute resources. But also sometimes we need these remote compute resources, cloud-based resources or HPC-based resources. And um, data needs to flow between them. Or um, on the other hand, as we have heard before, sometimes data is too large to be efficiently transferred. So in this case, um, the, the, the orchestrator here will supply or deploy um, simulation algorithms also to local resources to move the algorithm to the data and not vice versa. And on top of that here, you have the kind of the round trip and the memorizing capability. So from the metadata that we create here, we try to derive events based on machine learning um, that are then stored in the digital brain and from whom other instances of the same product can learn and trigger trigger new um, operations being then performed on the machine level. And for that end, we have different components here, um, which are operated uh, digital brain platform services. And then on the left-hand side, we have the authoring tools um, with which models and, uh, and algorithms are provided. But we also have a front end here, um, which is used to interface with the digital brain level for users and expert users. And that also has um, a community building and a marketplace um, character, which is important for the commercialization of the final result of the project. So we, we are executing applications in the brain for different, of different kinds, modeling and simulation, as well as data analytics and machine learning algorithms. And they need to be um, executed and deployed on different compute resources. I've, I've named them. Yeah, as I said before, EGI is our cloud provider on, and HPC provider in the project. And the application execution is based on uh, pre-existing components that will be further um, that will be further developed within the framework of the digital brain project. So we see different challenges here, like the seamless integration between cloud and HPC, but also um, down to the to the sensor to the sensor level that that you see at the third bullet point here. We need to support a variety of execution mechanisms and also workflows. As you have seen, there are some um, some experiments, some sen some scenarios that cover different machines, and, and we have to have some some kind of workflow support in here. And afterwards. Um, the whole solution will be run on a commercial basis. So we also have to care about yeah, some, some stuff like billing and utterly important security mechanisms because we are we are working in a commercial world here and the companies are not keen on providing their data um, freely accessible. So 
This is where we are starting from. We are starting from the digital, uh, sorry, the cloud factoring solution that has already a lot of components. So entry points for the customers, um, execution engines that are agnostic to the underlying um, infrastructures. And some of them are named here like Propster and Cloud Broker and Mikado is a new development that is being done within a digital project. And then we have all the different um, elements that can be executed and that will run in EGI um, um, yeah, properties. So the Cloud Broker platform, I, I think I have to speed up a little bit, is a, a multi-cloud platform that can interface with, with different cloud infrastructures and HPC centers, including um, EGI's um, pro provisions. Um, Flopster is a component that um, is focusing on supporting data intensive workflows um, that, for instance, can be envisaged to be used for the um, design of experiments approach in the experiments, which is about the, the molding simulation that I mentioned. And uh, then Ricardo is for automated deployment of containerized applications on different cloud platforms. And this is currently being extended to also support and utilize edge and fork resources. So to cover the full range from the embedded system to the high performance computing machine. Okay, I'd like to close my uh, talk with hinting you again to more details uh, to our open calls. They will be um, launched, so the first one will be launched next year. Um, we will put the open call out in, in March next year, and uh, then there is a, there is some, some time to prepare um, kind of, well, lightweight proposals. They are approximately 10 pages. Um, and then the, the use case, the new use cases being called in these open calls, will be executed from September 2020, 2021 onwards. Now, who can participate? Um, of course, we are working in the manufacturing um, environment, and um, these use cases need to have a motivation from an end user, which is a manufacturing SME. But you can also apply as a consortium, and, and all these experiments should have a small consortium of let's say minimum three partners where the end user is uh, required, but then you can add independent software vendors that bring new services to our um, infrastructure. You can add engineering consultants helping with modeling the um, behavior of the industrial product from the manufacturing company. You can also bring research organizations or high performance computing centers to these small consortia and even a new digital innovation hubs. So the number of experiments all in all will be 14. We will call for seven in each call and per experiment you can expect roughly 100k euros of support. Not Having not said not this, I thank you all for your interest and I'm there is one minute left for questions. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if it was only me, but uh, it was everything okay until the slide number 12. So okay. I was stuck in, in that in that slide. So maybe Oops. some of the people uh, could uh, could see the, the rest of the of the slides. Okay, uh, let's open now the time for the questions because the session is going to finish. Um, anyone who would like to uh, ask some something to Andre? Um, no questions. Okay, uh, I would like to ask you something. Uh, well, considering that some of our EEI, HPC and cloud providers are going to participate in the provision of services for the Digital BIM project, yeah. uh, from your knowledge of the current uh, Digital BIM pilots, uh, what will be the main challenges for the EEI providers when supporting these pilots? 
Yeah, I, I think there. So what we are talking about are not these huge um, simulation runs that we have heard about, for instance, in the astrophysical um, um, domain. Um, the, those simulations, um, when we run design of experiments, um, they will be demanding when you come from a, from an SME point of view because they simply don't have the resources and if they run them on their own machines, it would take them weeks. So we expect that um, we, we need HPC resources to run many um, simulations in parallel in short time. Each simulation not being overwhelmingly complex if you compare it with highest end uh, challenges to HPC centers that come from a uh, scientific driven point of view, like for instance, also weather uh, prediction, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so to provide um, these resources for many simulations um, in parallel at, the quick, at, at you know, in short time, um, that will be um, one of the challenges, and um, and we can also envisage to use the cloud resources there. It's not 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 just um, HPC and high end HPC. Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, then I will suggest to stop here the, the session. If you have any other questions, please you can contact directly to our speakers. We will up, upload the, the presentations in the Indico page. And uh, thank you, Anna, Henning, and Andre for being here today with us. And um, anything else, thank you for attending this, uh, the, this meeting and uh, have a nice lunch time. Bye-bye. Yeah, bon appetito, bye-bye, thank you.